All right, I think uh, we can start. Um, hello, everybody, and a uh, very warm welcome here at the EPC uh, for the policy dialogue, uh, the Swedish presidency's race to enhance green competitiveness. Uh, this policy dialogue is uh, co-organized, so it's uh, the EPC, uh, and also CEPS, uh, the Swedish Institute for European Policy Studies, who uh, kindly agreed to, to do this event together with us. And um, yeah, this. Uh, my name is uh, Philip Lausberg. I'm a policy analyst here at the EPC. I work in the uh, Europe's political economy department. And um, um, yeah, and I will be guiding you through this uh, policy dialogue today. Um, yeah, the, the EU has pledged to become the first uh, climate neutral continent uh, in the world by 2050. And by 2030, he wants to uh, have reduced uh, greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55% uh, compared to 1990 levels. So these are very ambitious plans. Um, but at the same time, um, you need, of course, industry to do that. And um, the EU currently is experiencing an unprecedented challenge to its competitiveness. Uh, following Russia's full-scale invasion of uh, Ukraine, Energy and other input costs have uh, uh, increased disproportionately compared to other parts of the world, um, while at the same time financing costs uh, have increased in a highly inflationary environment. Um, and what's more, uh, aggressive industrial policy initiatives, especially in, in, in China already, but also in the United States, um, have, uh, have turned into a threat to, to Europe's uh, manufacturing base and to its green transition goals. So um, as a response to that, uh, the European Commission has uh, put forward a proposal for a green industrial plan, a green deal industrial plan in, in February. And in March, it has tabled uh, propositions for a net zero industry act and a critical raw materials act. It also plans uh, to table a proposal for a new sovereignty fund, which will uh, probably be out in, in, in June. Um, so uh, there's a lot uh, to discuss here, a lot of initiatives that are being uh, uh, tabled at the moment. And uh, yeah, what we'll be looking at in particular today is how this Green Deal industrial plan and other initiatives can enable uh, to, uh, to how can they develop um, yeah, uh, competitiveness and uh, sustainable uh, uh, supply chains, manufacturing processes and products. And um, but also what is the added value of all of that? Because, of course, we already have uh, quite a lot of um, um, existing policies uh, and sectoral strategies such, uh, uh, such as Repower EU, uh, the current industrial strategy or the circular economy uh, action plan. And um, so, yeah, uh, and then, of course, uh, looking at the Swedish Council presidency, who has really taken this topic as one of their uh, main focus areas, we would like to see uh, more in detail what, what the Swedes have been doing on this, what they are still planning to do, and um, yeah, uh, what is their take on, on the proposed Green Deal industrial plan. So um, to do so, we have assembled a, a very distinguished panel. Uh, that I now have the pleasure to introduce to you. Um, of course, uh, first I will start uh, with Ambassador Torbjörn Haag, uh, who has been so kind to, to join us from, from the Swedish uh, permanent uh, representation to the EU, um, who will uh, uh, start with the keynote just in a moment. Um, then to my right, uh, we have uh, Carolina Vigo, who is Government uh, Affairs Director for the Green Transformation of Industries at Siemens. Um, then we have, uh, on the other end, we have uh, jo Mr. Joachim Nunes de Almeida, who is Director for Mobility and Energy Intensive Industries at DG Grow at the European Commission. Um, then we have, um, to, to his uh, right, we have um, uh, Ursula Woodburn, who is Program Director at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainable Leadership. And not, last but not least, uh, our partners from CEPS have uh, sent uh, Mats Engström, uh, who is a senior advisor yeah, at the Swedish Institute for, for, for European Policy Studies. Um, I would like to now give the floor uh, to Ambassador Haag uh, to, to start uh, with a keynote speech. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's very good to be here. I uh, hope you will have a good seminar today. Um, I, um, I'll just start off with, with a few comments from our side. Um, 
Uh, well, first of all, a precedence in the Swedish precedence race. That sounds like a challenge, sort of. Uh, but when we enter this this uh, this phase of of a presidency and presidency planning, we very much uh, opted for focusing on, you know, what is the agenda, what is the flow of things, where do we fit in in these six months. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not sort of uh, downsizing the importance of what we're doing. Uh, who am I to do that? But uh, we prefer to see that in a in a sequence of things. That is, uh, that we set a, a, a an agenda for the uh, for the union. There is a goal to work towards, and we do that, and we 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 do our part of it. But we do not think in terms of that it is us sort of uh, shaping shaping uh, shaping uh, the whole program now it it's worth rem remembering that the green and digital transitions they are of course the core um, core parts of this commission's mandate it's well anchored in at the european council level and it is a program that we're all pursuing and that is sort of the the approach we take it uh, take on it <clears throat> and that that is indeed very important uh, so my life and what we are doing, it, it is very much about down-to-earth work. It's very much about trilogues. Uh, it's very much about council negotiations. On the green side, we're close to uh, to completing uh, uh, the ambitions uh, on the climate side. Uh, there are one or two things left, uh, but I, I'm very hopeful that this, this will now uh, play out quite well uh, in, in the coming uh, weeks and months. Um, for the digital side, true, um, it's fascinating to see that uh, the digital issues, they are sort of um, going a bit under the radar uh, or have been in comparison to the, the green climate issues. Uh, it's developing quite well. Um, we haven't had at council sort of the big battles around these things and in fact most of the uh, general approaches that we've been able to reach um, in this and previous presidencies we've been able to to settle at working party level in unanimity that was true for the dsa for the dma it was true for the chips act and it is true for the the data act so that's quite an achievement that doesn't mean that um uh for that they are uh easy uh, sort of challenges um, we uh, are making great, great deal of progress here uh, this spring we have concluded the trilogues on the chips act and we are well advanced on the data act and on the uh, european id uh, system the eid uh, on, on these two fires i'm very hopeful that we will see tangible process now in, <clears throat> in the coming two months as for the ai act true uh, that's a more of a challenge uh, that we will leave to our Spanish colleagues to pick up in trilogues with the European Parliament in the autumn, mainly due to delays in the European Parliament. Uh, but it is also reflecting, uh, of course, the challenges that you have in that particular regulatory ambition. And uh, it, it is indeed a, a very crucial debate that we will see much more of in the autumn and perhaps in the winter too. Our contribution to these, uh, this, uh, this approach of green and digital transition was perhaps that we wanted to add a flavor of competitiveness to it. Because we're convinced that, uh, uh, that uh, adapting a society, developing a society, taking things forward, um, you can do that based on competitiveness only. Uh, so we wanted to to set that uh, perspective, uh, reset that perspective, perhaps a bit on the agenda of of the EU, and uh, the European Council also concluded uh, uh, in very important respects on that now in March, and we will see more of that in June. Uh, and we sincerely hope that this will, perspective will stay on the on the uh, radar screen for the EU and be a guiding principle uh, for the years to come. Indeed, building, of course, on the success of the single market, deepening it, uh, developing it, uh, and pushing it forward in all respects. So uh, what uh, what challenges are there here when looking ahead? And I think this, this will be very interesting for you to dig into here uh, today. I think that one um, 
and we will hear more of specific uh, uh, proposals on which we're working. We will uh, be devoting much time on the uh, Raw Materials Act this spring. I think the Net Zero Act will follow suit, uh, but I think that will be more a focus of our Spanish colleagues, simply because we need to, to plan our work in a way that, that makes it possible to cope with the challenges. So, uh, if you look at the challenges here, what, where are we and, uh, and how, how are things developing? I think that so far, looking at the green transition, we uh, saw as an effect of the, um, uh, the Russian war in Ukraine, sort of a rounding up along these principles, uh, pushing forward, of course, the, the move out of fossil fuel dependency and thereby sort of in uh, the the power of the green transition and that is a very powerful powerful uh, development however it is also true that uh, as we're now approaching sort of the implementation phase of all, what we've done in this in this um, area you can also see focus shifting you can see member states asking themselves okay how are we going to cope with this and now it becomes much more of a reality on the ground in the political life uh, at national level. And that reflects a bit also on, 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 uh, uh, on um, the files that we've been working on lately, where I see uh, more challenges of rallying support for, for the outcome, actually. And that perhaps indicates that what we're doing, it is, it is not to be taken for granted. This is something we know you need to work on. Uh, continuously uh, with persistence and and, and uh, keeping a very clear eye on what is the goal, what do we want to achieve, what are the political difficulties that we need to uh, to, to go through in order to, to keep that perspective. And that's perhaps where we are now. So if we so far sort of have a feeling of success in this work, um, that is nothing that I think we should take for granted. This is something we need to work on on a daily and weekly basis to to convince our constituencies of this way, uh, that this way is the way to move forward. So that's one aspect. A second aspect, uh, that was my second point, uh, and there I think perhaps that is also a continuous debate. It is about, you know, what do you do at the European level? And what do you leave to the member states? Um, good old question. Um, but in this sense, what, what are we doing at European level? Are we focusing on setting frameworks, creating uh, ways forward, uh, but not going into detail? Or are we looking for sort of quick fixes uh, with the attempt, uh, with the, the intention of those then sort of solving the main uh, challenges that we have. But I think at the moment we're, we're trying to do both. There is a slight tendency to sort of look at the, the big sexy things, the raw materials act, the net zero act, uh, initiatives of that kind. Um, we have uh, a continuous debate on uh, planning permits in the member states. Fine. You have EU regulations there coming into play, which are of, of great importance and, and which have uh, direct consequences for member states at national level. But this is also very much about uh, seeing to that your own administration is in good shape, is handling issues in a, in a workable way, uh, and is simply keeping re reasonable deadlines, which you necessarily would have to set at national level. And there the balance perhaps is not obvious. Uh, and that is perhaps one issue that we would need to devote continued uh, uh, attention to, asking ourselves, you know, what, what, what is uh, the kind of regulations that uh, conceivably will have uh, a good effect and uh, what, uh, 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 what initiatives are there that or thinking uh, uh, is there out there that might be a bit of a too much of sort of the, the vision of, of having a quick fix to issues which you may uh, need to attack at national level or regional level indeed uh, in order to solve. Um, so all in all, what 
we believe in and what we think uh, we, what what would sort of be our contribution to these uh, this uh, and our perspective on, on on these themes that we're discussing today? Well, it is very much about keeping the vision of uh, an economy that is adaptable, that is developing, uh, that is not locking itself into into old solutions. There was. Um, a uh, quite a character in Swedish public life, uh, who once famously stated, and he was a social democratic politician. He famously stated that it's 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 not um, the new technology I'm afraid of; it's the old one. Uh, and that is sort of the perspective I think that you you often hear from us in Scandinavia, and uh, something that we represent uh, uh, with with strong strong convictions. Um, we think. We need to do more in research and development. Um, and that is indeed also a task for the European Union. We need to think about our skills uh, and um, labor um, availability. I, I remember I did migration issues here uh, around the first Swedish presidency in 2001. And much of the discussion you now have on shortages in, in the labor sector, we saw coming already then. But uh, addressing them in, in legal terms at, uh, or practical terms at the EU level uh, was as difficult then as it is perhaps, uh, as it is perhaps now as well. So these are, these are things we, 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 we need to, to think of about and, and keep a clear focus on. We are also convinced that there are a number of uh, infrastructural issues which could be should be addressed at European level. Um, we have a lively debate on energy policies, of course. Uh, last year was, was very colorful in that respect. It's a bit calmer now. But it doesn't change the fact that there are underlying um, factors of considerable importance there, the interconnection between grids, um, the, the, the frameworks needed uh, to, to, uh, uh, to talk of a proper energy market in Europe, which we may have in the sense that we're uh, addressing it in terms of the energy market. Uh, but if you look at it uh, sectorial wise, uh, you will soon see that uh, uh, there would be very much more to do there. So I think that uh, what would be very helpful, and I think your seminar here is, 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 a, is, is a very good contribution in that respect, is to address these issues a bit. What do we do at the EU level? What are the quick fixes? And perhaps uh, what underlying structural points are there that we need to address? Uh, but which of, of these are sort of slipping away from our intention simply because the challenges themselves uh, are quite difficult to, to address. Um, so, so these are in, in short sort of uh, the perspectives that uh, I would, would uh, um, offer to you today. And I wish you all the best. And I, I hope you will have an interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Ambassador Haag, for this uh, insights into yeah, the, the Swedish point of view, which of course is very important uh, since uh, you are holding uh, the council presidency. And I think, uh, yeah, the topic of competitiveness has been uh, something that Sweden has been caring about for a long time already. And uh, I think uh, it, it, it's, it's great that you're pushing for that. Um, so yeah, again, thank you very much for, for, for coming. I, I know you're very busy and you probably will have to leave uh, uh, very soon. Um, but uh, now I would like to uh, turn to our other speakers. Um, and I would like to uh, uh, turn to Mr. Joaquim Nunes de Almeida from the European Commission from DG Grow. Um, since uh, you, of course, are working in the machine room, so to say, of, of what we're talking about, so really devising the new uh, uh, industrial plans. And uh, yeah, I would like to ask you um, 
yeah um can you first of all yeah reflect maybe on 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 on, on ambassador hawk's works words but also also introduce the current work and the future plans that the commission has uh with respect to green competitiveness okay thank you very much um does it maybe the 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 first important thing to say is that i think that industrial policy considerations are back uh things like where things are produced and where raw materials come from uh, started being becoming important questions uh, this is not to say that europe or dg grow or commissioner breton have the ambition of full full self-sufficiency but let's put it like that that we we don't just trust the normal functioning of the world market as leading to the results that we need to have and the bottom line is that we want to have a foothold uh, both on critical raw materials and on net zero industries um to be a player uh we can we have we consider that on issues like critical raw materials or net zero technologies we cannot just afford to say well it happens that we're totally dependent here but it's okay no we don't think it is okay um you can use easily the russian gas analogy this is very much you know to simplify things it would be like we simply you know don't want to replace for instance the dependency that we had on russian gas by a dependency on chinese solar panels um i.e. Uh, dependency is what's very much behind the dependency, vulnerability, strategic autonomy, the need to be somewhat of a player. Again, we believe in open trade. We believe in, we, we, we want to keep being a trading uh, political entity, but we are worried of losing control of um, many of these things. Uh, and that's very much what's at the root of both critical raw materials and net zero. Um, I'm going to skip. I mean, I'm, I could go on for hours, as uh, I, you know, I've been behind this process, and I'm not going to go for hours. Of, I'll promise you. But just picking up a couple of things, like, for instance, on net zero, as you will see, we have covered both technologies where Europe is still strong and technologies where we stopped being strong. So on the first, you would have like electrolyzers for green hydrogen or for hydrogen uh, or wind turbines. We're still quite strong there, but uh, the positions are eroding quite fast. So we, we, we need to both act on industries where we are still strong and on, industry, on industries that we are not uh, strong at all like uh, solar PVs or many of the critical uh, raw materials. On... Exactly. And I mean, and behind this, you often, I mean, not always, but you often find, you often reach the conclusion that you're in the hands of China. Uh, not always, but, uh, and if it's not China, it, you know, I have to be somewhat diplomatic, but okay. Uh, Overall, we're not depend. You know, you could say, well, we're fully dependent on Australia and Canada. It's a bit more complicated than that. I mean, Australia and Canada can play a role, but we're not fully. The situation is not that the alternative of our self sufficiency is that we would be fully in, uh, dependent on Canada and Australia. Um, we've also, I've also noticed the importance of having fixed targets, both on critical raw materials and on net zero. It has captured a lot of the uh, attention. So on net zero, we've got 40% uh, self-sufficiency target for all the technologies covered. On critical raw materials, we want to have 10% of the extraction, 40% of the refining. Often the situation on refining is even worse than on extraction. Um, 15% on recycling. And here we're often confronted with, oh, only 15% of recycling. That's so unambitious. Well, it's not. At this stage, we recycle 1%. So 15% would be quite extraordinary. Um, and 
the reality is that there's not yet much to recycle anything from because we're talking about mostly lines of new products. I mean, the solar panels, the, so the, 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 the wind turbines, the electric vehicle batteries, they will end their life in 10, 15, 20 years. So that will be the moment where you can probably recycle big time. But now uh, there's only as much as the reality of things uh, is that especially on critical raw materials, we will have to deal with enormous amounts of more extraction, both here and outside of Europe, if we are to achieve uh, the objectives of the Green Deal while keeping our prosperity. Um, the acts are mostly about administrative facilitation, as uh, the, the Swedish deputy representative said. So they're both mostly about permitting, facilitating the administrative life of approval of projects at national level, one-stop shops, shorter deadlines, avoid the situations that projects take 7, 10, 12 years. Uh, on net zero, you've also got some provisions on, on procurement and auctions and subsidies to households on uh, helping sustainable uh, and resilience considerations. You won't see much on state aids. State aids are discussed on a parallel level on the implementation of the state aid rules. You have to look at the temporary state aid framework reform and possibly on the discussion of the sovereignty fund. Uh, in that, we're often confronted by the fact that, well, you're not doing the European IRA. No, we're not doing the European IRA. Europe is, is constitutionally different. We don't have a federal budget like the US has. There's all the whole issue of state aids that comes into play, the fact that some member states have deep purses and others don't, and you get into a, 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 a you get a bit into a different uh, story. Um, and the discussion on this, you know, so on the needs assessment document that accompanies the net zero industry act, you talk about a need of 19 billion euro uh, investment for which it's estimated that we have eight, nine billion euro now in the EU budget, which means that there is a shortfall if we are to achieve our ambitions in the EU budget, of course. Last word about, especially on critical raw materials, just to remind you that we're talking not just about re bringing the industry back to Europe, but also of diversifying our sources of supply. So we need a much more active, intelligent uh, team Europe like uh, diplomacy with the raw materials diplomacy with the rest of the world to diversify our sources of supply. I hope I didn't speak too much. Sorry. Thank you very much. Um... Thank, thank you very much for this, um, I think, quite a concise uh, overview of, of, of what you're doing at the Commission and uh, you're really trying to, you know, square a lot of uh, seemingly opposite goals, uh, you know, keeping open trade, uh, introducing industrial policy mechanisms, uh, you know, getting enough uh, uh, financing together as well, but also making sure that uh, the process is as simple as possible, which, of course, in the European uh, level has, uh, you know, it's not, not always that easy. So, yeah, thanks very much for that. And I think uh, now it would be interesting uh, to hear Carolina Vigo from Siemens, because, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, what does all of that uh, uh, mean for industry and how does industry, uh, how has industry, uh, you know, um, conceived the plans of the commission and how realistic do you think it is and what is it there in there that you think uh, helps you and what do you think uh, is missing and uh, what could be improved thank you um thank you for the invitation first and uh, very nice to to see you all and, and being in this panel so um our take, I mean, we very much welcome, of course, this, this package and uh, the proposals that are out there. I think they, they really go in the right direction in the trying to square the impossible, um, to, to, to square the impossible um, circle, um, as, as you pointed out. Um, so um, that, that's clear. Of course, um, and I think uh, the director, uh, Mr. Nunez, mentioned um, it's not uh, a silver bullet. We cannot stop at the Net Zero Industry Act and the Critical Raw Materials Act um, that were out. Um, 
the ambassador mentioned also um, uh, the single market, the implementations, uh, the, the challenges between uh, EU versus national uh, levels, having the, the right resources also for our um, um, administrations to, uh, to, to implement the, the actual proposals. Um, but clearly, again, um, the, the proposals, the acts go into, into the right directions. Um, now, commenting specifically on the Net Zero Industry Act, um, what we very much like is that the um, coverage of technologies is it's quite broad, if I can say. Um, all technologies that we need for the 55% targets are in scope. But not all of them, if I can say. Um, we see some, uh, um, uh, let's say, low uh, low voltage technologies in the grid are not um, included in the proposal, and that's of course a missing opportunity. I don't know. I'm thinking about the um, uh, EV chargers. Uh, it's it's really key, of course, for for decarbonizing our transport sector. So. Um, I think um, what uh, the, the presidency and in general EU institutions could do is indeed to, to further um, think about, you know, which technologies are really needed for, for our transitions. Are we covering them all? Probably not. So that's something maybe to, where to enrich the text. Um, same for energy efficiency technologies. They are covered, of course, under the Net Zero Industry Act, but they're not considered as strategic uh, technologies. Um, which, if I may, uh, is a little bit odd considering our energy efficiency principle. So uh, something maybe to, um, to reflect on. Um, and, uh, and of course, um, what, when I mentioned this specific and, and it's what also the director was mentioning before, um, we have, I believe, three different types of technologies um, under the Net Zero Industry Act. We have two different types of raw materials under the Critical Raw Materials Act. And this, to, to our reading at least, complexify um, all um, the, the goals that, that we put forward. So I think maybe for the um, EU institutions, what we could um, ask for is to really to try to simplify the text as much as possible, because of course, we cannot and we shall not copy paste the the use the us um approach that's that's not legally possible but also not our wish um but clearly what we can maybe um learn um if i may say is try to to simplify this regulatory framework um and that will really facilitate also the implementation the uptake at at national level um, I believe we, we were discussing about uh, the procurement uh, under the Net Zero Industry Act. Again, um, the, the rules are, are quite compli complex, if I can say. Um, and um, what I wanted to, to, to finish maybe um, was um, to do again a, a step back because of, as I was saying at the beginning, um, we have these two nice uh, proposals, this, this package, uh, more will come with the sovereignty funds, um, um, but um, what we need is to, to continue the work on uh, the single market, on hue harmonized rules, because otherwise we won't have the technologies that we have today, you know, scale them up at um, at uh, continent level, um, it will be anyway a suboptimal solution from both an economic and an environmental point of view. So um, we we are really um, asking for 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 uh, these single market solutions that I think is very much in the in the mind of of the Commission. Maybe more challenging in uh, in the Council, but that's that's our wish. Um, and uh, last but not least, we have to to think ahead. Um, of course, because as you as you said, uh, Mr. Nunez, we we are not able um, to, or we are not in the position to recycle PV modules um, today. It's it's going to be in 10, 15 uh, years time. But um, this 10, I mean, we have 10, 15 years time to to prepare um, for this recycling, and it's great that you put forward this this target. Uh, but then let's think ahead of the infrastructures that we need. Um, grid was mentioned, of course, but also you know collecting, sorting infrastructures. Um, and um, this will, of course, facilitate all um, the, the recycling targets um, that that um, and refining that that you put forward. That's, I think, how, how we should um, approach this uh, this text um, and the, the coming years as well. 
Yeah, thanks very much. I think you raised some very You, you raised some very important issues. Um, I mean, of course, uh, which in the, which technologies, which industries should be covered? That's that's an important question. I think we'll come back to that later when we have our panel debate. I would like to also add here that uh, our um, uh, everyone who's following online can ask questions. Uh, you can you can type them in, and uh, in the Q A session later on, uh, they will be considered. Uh, <laughs> Indeed, we can even consider them somehow aware the uh, during the debate. Um, but yeah, in the single market you brought up, um, uh, simplification, things like that, I think these are all the issues that we talk more about later. It will also be interesting to hear uh, uh, Mr. Nunes, I made a, uh, you know, coming back on 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 these points. Um, but now I would like to um, I would like to turn to Ursula Woodburn. Um, yeah, what what is your take on on, on the current uh, uh, policies and debate uh, on, on green um, competitiveness? Um, do you think uh, that it, enough is done also on the sustainability side? Do you think competitiveness comes at the cost uh, sometimes of uh, sustainability and uh, yeah, well, you, you, your take on, on this debate will be interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip, and great to be here. So indeed, I think we could dig in a little bit on this concept of, of green competitiveness, because, you know, we heard clearly from the ambassador that they had the Swedish belief in, in competitiveness as a, as a concept. I think it's important to remember that uh, the Green Deal, or at the heart of the Green Deal, it is founded on... Uh, concept of competitive sustainability. So the idea that the, uh, the the race towards climate neutrality and so on is the EU's uh, growth strategy and so forth, as Ursula von der Leyen has, has said on many times, is based upon, on, the, on this idea of competitive sustainability, right? And this is also one of the EU's strengths. I mean, at CISL, we did an analysis um, looking at the different indicators that makes up competitive sustainability. Um, so it looks at the metrics, it looks at environmental conditions, social and governance, as well as questions around industry and business and so forth. And I think clearly what it's shown is that this is also at the heart of the EU's resilience to change, right? So how has the EU responded to the pandemic, to the war in Ukraine, to other issues like this? It's responded by leaning on the Green Deal, leaning on the real push for green technologies and a, and a move forward, right? And if you really address this and, and look into this, um, our analysis also shows a bit where the EU is, has many strengths and then maybe where there are some gaps. So I think clearly the single market and also long-term regulatory stability to some extent, or at least a view as to what we are trying to achieve, a really key EU goals and key EU strengths, because I think you know, for businesses and for industry, if you know where you're supposed to get to, then you, you can perhaps find a pathway towards that. Um, I think we were all a little concerned by recent debates about some of the, for example, files on the Fit for 55 and others, where there was a bit of shakiness there. And I don't think that's healthy either way. We, we need to go for it. We need to decide where we need to be and and uh, set, set those wheels in motion. And... Um, in terms of gaps, what you can really see is the EU is a front runner in many technologies. Sometimes we fail to sort of really roll out and scale them up. We have a lot of uh, innovation. Um, we have strong um, education systems and so forth, but um, we really need to see how we drive that. Um, and I think, you know, these are really key, key elements. Um, when we look at what has been proposed now from the Commission, I think there's some really... Um, I mean, as Carolina said, I think it's a really strong step forward and when it comes to the Net Zero Industry Act and so forth. Um, I think when we looked at it, we wondered a little bit because we thought about what does a real industry transformation mean, okay? It's not just the energy supply chains. It's not just the response to the energy supply technologies that are being mentioned in the I IRA. The EU has other strengths as well, for example, on energy efficiency. It's a real leader in a number of areas, for example. So how do we strengthen that? Um, we also considered that it might be worth looking at the value chains a little more, right? Because it's not just about the electrolyzers, but the steel for the for the windmills and so forth. So um, there's some different questions like that that I think do need to be surfaced as, as we move forward. And um, broadly, that we should not leave 
like let go of the focus on what we're trying to achieve. What are we trying to achieve? We're trying to achieve uh, climate neutrality. We're trying to achieve a pros prosperous EU, but also with environmental and social and other goals and to see really how best we can achieve that um, in indeed a much more interventionist global world. Um, we are competing with uh, very strong economies which are really intervening in a very specific way. And, and, it's, and the sort of systems that perhaps we are used to working with at the EU level, the global governance systems are shifting and it may be different types of partnerships and different types of um, ways forward that we may end up working with to drive forward green technologies and drive forward um, our response to the climate emergency and the many other crises that we're dealing with at the moment. So some initial thoughts. <laughs> Yeah, thanks very much. I think you really summed up very nicely the complex issue that's at stake here, meaning sustainability and how to square it with uh, with competitiveness and the, the very ambitious goals that we have with uh, respect to climate change and then the competitive angle that has really escalated in the last half year or so. And I think uh, there's a great opportunity, in fact, there because never have been had the goals of you know sustainability and uh, competitiveness or industry been so closely al aligned, I think. But of course, it, it, it holds a lot of challenges. And uh, these challenges, of course, as you already said, it's also about you know partnerships. It's about the trade environment that is becoming much less liberal. Um, and I think uh, that's also an, uh, the point where I'm now uh, turning uh, to Mats because he uh, has been working on that a lot and I think that the whole issue of uh, you know the geopolitical environment that this uh, industrial policy green industrial policy is set in I think it's it's crucial to for our understanding of how we can go forward um, and uh, yeah I, I would like to, to to ask you if you can tell us a little bit about your point of view on uh, yeah um, uh, the constraints but also the opportunities that uh, this uh, uh, more um, competitive and uh, maybe some, in some ways even more hostile trade environment and, and geopolitical environment offers to us. Thank you, Philip, and thank you for uh, co-organizing the cooperation we have on, on doing this. But that's a big topic and I will not talk too much in the introduction because I think we will get back to many issues later. But maybe I should start where, where Director Nunn just ended, actually. I think you talked about an develop an intelligent uh, Team Europe uh, critical uh, uh, raw material strategy that is more developed than is currently being done. I think that is uh, clear from the Commission statements and also from uh, President von der Leyen's speech actually in this room here at DPC on China that there is a need to de-risk these supply chains and I think the sensitivities are, are rather well known. I don't dive into that here, but what I think is important in that perspective to start there is the recognition in Europe that we are not the strong global power that perhaps some of us still feel that we are. We are a weaker global power than we used to be, and that is also reflected in our relations to other parts of the world. We can't really tell these other countries that we want to have as alternatives to China what to do. So, so uh, partnerships really have to be real partnerships. And, and I know DG Grow is recognizing that, for example, in the critical raw material partnerships that are now being developed. But this also uh, encompasses some hard choices, I think. So at CIPS, we have done several interviews with some of these countries uh, uh, in Africa, for example, in, in Asia. And, and you really need to recognize their need for economic development, for industrial development, for refining their raw materials, for example. <laughs> and, and that will also necessitate a, a Team Europe approach, as you rightly said, because if European countries compete on the best contract in a short-term way, uh, we will get played out against each other. And many have noted and analyzed that China's offer in Africa, for example, is not as good as it may be seemed. If you look at Zambia, for example, it wasn't that really good for Zambia. Uh, but it's attractive still because they talk the same language. They have the money, quick money. They have package deals. They also uh, come now and talk about economic development, about research, cooperation, institutes, refining. Uh, one of them was recently in 
in one of the West African countries and talked about gaining more uh, benefits from, from the iron ore there. So, so this has to be countered by a real um, uh, offer, a real offer about cooperation. And there I think uh, the EU has to scale up the, the resources used and the coherence. And we can discuss more about that because that's also some inherent conflicts perhaps. Uh, probably there's a need for more refining of raw materials both in Europe and in Africa. But if we don't kind of explain that and, and put the money there in Africa, it will be creating a misperception, I think. So that's short about that. And I also think that links to the um, other parts of the necessary industry act, for example, with the green hydrogen development, where there are similar concerns in, in Africa and Latin American countries about the more extractive relationship uh, than, than they want, uh, so to speak. So there we also have possible conflicts of interest to the low carbon steel making in Europe compared to the import of the semi fabricated low carbon products from from Brazil say. So, so that is, uh, uh, I think, important to recognize that it has to be real partnerships and sometimes there will be conflicts of interest also here in, in Europe. But that's one part, and I don't go in now into the EU-US relationship because I guess we will get back perhaps to the IRA later, but we would, there will be the Trade and Technology Council later this month in, in Sweden, and that is of course important to try to solve these tensions. Um, but maybe we get back to that. But I wanted to say two more things before I stop in this introduction, and one is what you also alluded to, Ms. Woodburn, when it comes to the the strengths of, and you as, as well uh, to the strengths of European industry it's not only about the important sectors in the net zero industry act it's much wider than that and for example DG research and innovation has a really interesting now low carbon roadmap for circular uh, solutions uh, where they show the strength of circular economy industries in Europe in the global perspective for example so I think that's important uh, and, and also to look at industry in the wider sense the climate footprint of uh, many sectors of industry for example and there you get into more horizontal instruments perhaps but to stop I, I would also like to say just a word about the Brussels effect and the role that the regulation also has in the global competitiveness uh, perspective mm -hmm. because the, there is debate now how much regulation and the ambassador alluded to this also in the council negotiations uh, about a certain weariness when it comes to the implementation and new legislation. But at the same time, and there also DD Grow is doing interesting analytical work, I think it's the Brussels effect is real. Other parts of the world are looking to us for standards and which is also clear from this DG research and innovation study that well-designed regulations can also contribute to innovation and to competitiveness. So I think it's needed to have a more nuanced view on this issue about regulation. And for example, the now the eco-design directive, for example, could also create more innovation, more competitiveness, I think. But I'll stop. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You raised a lot of very interesting topics here that I think are worth uh, uh, debating. And uh, since now we are entering the open panel debate, um, um, yeah, I, I would like to actually come back to the IRA and uh, basically the international competition in, in, in industrial policy, because of course that's something that's been making the headlines recently and we keep seeing European companies who start to build their industrial capacities in the United States, or so they move away. The most recent example being Disman, a German heating specialist that uh, is producing heat pumps, and uh, the United States, uh, a, a U.S. Uh, uh, um, air conditioning uh, company, basically uh, bought the entire. Um, uh, heat pumps uh, part and because they had the money and you, if you look at uh, yeah the European uh, funding especially when it comes to to equity funding then there is a, is a huge gap when it comes to financing and I think the main reason why we see uh, you know uh, companies uh, relocating it's uh, first of all that scale up gap that we've been talking about but of course also the direct very direct and automatic character that the IRA uh, subsidies have. So my question here would be into the round and everyone can pick this up, uh, but um, how concretely would you say, or what has to be done to really 
you know, make sure that we don't deindustrialize because, of course, that is a danger with uh, this uh, heightened industrial policy uh, um, uh, efforts, and especially in the U.S., but also in China. And and where do you see concrete, um, you know, concrete uh, elements of, of of improvement? And of course, uh, we've heard from the Commission that you know the the plans they are on paper they are great, especially when it comes to the big targets of forty percent in, in that industry, but also uh, in in refinement of raw materials. Um, but yeah, how do you how do you how how can you counter this sort of automaticity? How you can counter the financial power? that some of these competitors have. So, yeah, whoever would like to take over. Or maybe uh, if you would like to. I can, well, I think that to start with, um, I mean, two things. So on, on the one hand, not all of these projects are market failures in the state aid sense of the word. For instance, a lot of mining extraction or refining projects in Europe don't happen as a result of administrative red tape, nimbyism, local opposition. I mean, if you see the quantities of raw materials that are needed for the next 10, 15, 20 years, the moment you extract them, you sell them well. I mean, the demand is so high that there's not a profitability, I mean, in some areas you might have it, but I'm just to say that in many areas, the permitting is indeed quite key. Second, yes, we do not have the capacity to do a system like the US, and I'm not sure that the commission would be happy to do exactly the same as the US, but I mean, we don't have a federal budget. We don't have the possibility of granting tax exemptions without going through the unanimity. You know, it's just not, on the shelf, but we have relaxed considerably our state aid. Um, we have relaxed to some extent our the, the, the conditions for granting of state aid. We have accepted the concept of matching aid, although varying according to the poverty of the country. So, but still at the end of the day, rich countries can subsidize projects simply because there's a similar project in China or the US that has been subsidized, which is a big step. Um, and that, and also, I mean, to the argument of saying, but this means if you authorize more state aids, it means that it's all going to be French and German projects because other smaller countries have no possibility of chipping in. But I mean, for Europe, it's probably better to have a big German or French project that pulls in a lot of Czech, Portuguese and Finnish SMEs than a Chinese project, uh, because it's either that or a Chinese project. Yeah, very, very interesting point there on the state aid part, because, of course, that's an argument you often don't hear that, you know, it's it's just the French and the Germans profiting. But, of course, they, their investments have a more immediate effect on, on the rest of Europe than, let's say, China or United States. Um, but, of course, at the same time, uh, the ideal solution would, of course, be more uh, European funding, I take it. And um, uh, it would be very interesting to see what uh, the European Sovereignty Fund proposition will look like. Um, I've also been uh, writing a paper on that with, with a colleague here, and I think it's also a, a focus of the EPC to, to really um, uh, look into the possibilities, but also into seeing, uh, uh, underlying the importance of, of, of more Euro European-wide funding. Um, but yeah, um, is, uh, yeah, I would like to also, yeah, um, Ursula Woodburn, if you would like to, to come in here, you, you're very welcome. Thanks. I think it's very interesting because, yeah, we do quickly get into a debate on investment broadly, which is then dependent on many other things. I think some of the amounts of money floating around in Europe is not so different to what is floating around in, in the States, but it's a little bit about how it's directed, the ease of investment and scale up across Europe. And, um, and I do also think there's a number of other quite interesting discussions at the moment, uh, such as the discussion, the, the recent proposal on the fiscal space that the, the commission just came out with. I mean, that uh, is a question of, will the member states actually have the fiscal space to invest in all these technologies? Um, and I think currently the answer is, no, probably. There, I mean, there are some kind of issues in terms of the, the, the fiscal setup, 
Um, and then the question is, what is the answer to that? Um, is it is it uh, a different setup, which I think is causing a lot of issues in, in the council because there's a lot of different views on that? Um, or is it really the sovereignty fund or other types of real climate funding that we should we should push? And, and I do wonder as well, because we do keep looking to European wide funding. Um, and then the question is, what does that look like? Where does it come from? Um, we're trying to repurpose a lot of different funds at the moment, whether it's the recovery fund, whether it's how we spend on Repower EU, whether it's you know how we repurpose the innovation fund and so forth. It's not a lot of new money around. Uh, how do we really do that and leverage uh, different blends of public and private finance? How do we address the situation in member states and so forth? So I, I think it goes beyond the sort of level of money, but more sort of questions about this, the, the quality where it's focused the, the sort of structural issues and I also wanted to quickly pick up on what Matt said as well about the circular economy I think that's super interesting and the strengths of the different industries I mean there's a question for example on advanced recycling EU has a very strong industry but we don't see that anywhere in, in the discussions and there's many other issues like that that I think we can really draw on the strengths we have um, and sort of see how because it, it is a race right now. It is a race to be a leader, not just to and not lose the things where we're strong, as well as consider where where should we be focusing our energies. We won't win on everything, right? So we have to see where we can yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah. I think it's 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 a matter of focus, but it's also a matter of pulling the strings together in a more efficient way, right? And then, as you said, there's all these programs that we have, and there is a lot of money floating around, and then using that in the most efficient way possible. I think that's that's a, it's a challenge that's very important. Um, I would would also be interesting to hear from um, from Carolina. Um, you know, how does industry, how does Siemens, for example, how do you um, experience uh, these pressures that come? Uh, you know, maybe the the attraction that U.S. Uh, uh, subsidies have on, on on your business, and how do you uh, would you say that the European programs that are available, how do they compare? How attractive they are in comparison? And 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 yeah, well, what is uh, what is the thinking process in in in, in the upper echelons of of, of, of Siemens management uh, on on how do they see the future of, of of Europe as a as a place to to do industry and compared to 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 other parts of the world. Yeah, tough question. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, um, Siemens is a multinational company. We're present in uh, 190 uh, countries. So um, the, the presence, you know, is, is broad. But for sure, Europe will remain our uh, core, if I can say, um, business in terms of, you know, um, uh, manufacturing sites, but also um, looking at the, also our revenues. Um, I think... Um, our customers are are very much based in in Europe, and and so will continue also for for the long term. Um, now, uh, yeah, um, the I think the the beauty I think we we can use these words um, of the US IRA um, is not much about the the amount. I, I very much agree with you. Is is not that compared to to the EU. Uh, but rather its simplicity. Um, it's uh, it's really easy, you know, to to get um, the the support there. Um, again, as uh, the director was saying, uh, the you know the structure is very different as well as well. Um, so the, there are reasons, uh, but this uh, should not you know make us uh, shy. Um, and then we should again uh, get be inspired. I think uh, from um, from this framework and see. Um, what could work, um, but then there is much more to to be done. It's uh, it's not just um, you know uh, public public funds. It's also private funds. And here, I have in mind, of course, um, taxonomy, which is a great tool to to facilitate the dia the dialogue between um, the 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 real economy, let's say, and and the investors. And um, and here, uh, our take is um, you know the the commission is working days and night to to uh, expand this framework, which is great. Um, maybe we should think a little bit more on how to implement it because um, some of the criteria we see are simply not working in practice. Um, um, again, in terms of how to, to comply with uh, not the, the ambition I'm talking about. 
Um, so there is, yes, of course, a public side, but also a private. And then ultimately, and this is more also to attract investments from, from outside, is to make sure we have uh, a good regulatory framework. Um, I, I was saying uh, the single, I was talking about the single market before, and I will re-say it because it's really what allows us to, to scale up the solutions um, at, at EU level and not to have this jeopardize system which, uh, which we have now. Uh, but it's also about, you know, coherent uh, rules, um, um, fiscal policies, of course, that are dealt at, at national level. But here, of course, to make sure that, you know, we all go towards the right, uh, to the same directions is, uh, is also a way to pull further resources. Um, so, yeah, there is a lot on the menu, let's say, that <laughs> we could pick. Yeah, thanks. Maybe something like concrete, where we would say there's uh, one or two things or three things where you'd say concretely this you think should be changed in, in, in an industry point of view, from an industry or a Siemens point of view. Well, concretely, one thing um, we noticed is that, and it was also, I think, noticed from, from the ambassador's speech, um, we see digital and green completely, you know, um, divided while we should them uh, put them together. I think the, the commission at the beginning, especially, was was emphasizing this this g digital twin, um, and now it seems, yeah, uh, not lost in translation, but um, yeah, it's less. Um, I would say less. Uh, it's less visible in in the actual regulatory terms, and that's a pity because that also accelerates. Um, all our solutions for I don't know uh, microgrid uh, renewables. We yes, it's about hardware, but it's also about software. So that's I would say um, one uh, first solutions we see. Then going back to to circular economy and again my my mantra on single markets, um, we see um, the the commission's excellent approach to to push for regulate for regulation instruments. Um, but ultimately, um, some uh, yeah, some some member states, some actors, uh, let's say, push for more um, national flexibilities, and that's a minus again because um, I mean we were talking about before, uh, um, you know, recycling. Um, you need to have a, an internal market of, of secondary materials to uh, to reach our um, circular targets and and. If we keep uh, maintaining the, the national flexibilities, we we won't make it simply. Um, and I'm not even talking about the economic costs, but um, it's uh, I think it's a given. So these are uh, some concrete solutions. I hope um, mm -hmm. it answers. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, the single market aspect and the regulatory aspect uh, that you really stress here is very important. And that goes also back to what Matt said, I think about the regulatory superpower, this idea of having uh, not only you know, these standards in Europe that facilitate business making, but you can also actually change how other people uh, do produce and, and, and do business abroad if they, uh, if they are, uh, if they adopt those. So, uh, but yeah, if, if, if Mats, if you would like to come in uh, on, on what's just been said and maybe on that as well. Yeah, so the, I think there have been many uh, good things uh, said. Uh, uh, so just on the uh, financing, I, I think, uh, um, it, one thought as an analyst that will be interesting is, of course, looking also a few years ahead. We have an American presidential election. Mm -hmm. What will happen now in the Trade and Technology Council? Maybe the EU needs to do a deal rather quickly, even if it's not the optimal one, or maybe not. I don't know how they are thinking about these, the, the negotiators. But, but then also what you referred to, Philip, where you are doing excellent work is really what, how does this reflect in the review of the multi-ethnical financial framework, for example, that the Commission is now working on? Now we have this kind of necessary immediate reactions to the IRA, but if we want a more long-term financing, how should it look? And, and uh, you have written about that. So I just think that is really important to, to not only now to react to the IRA, but to look further and then also look wider at European industry as we have been discussing. And as you, you were just saying, uh, some years ago, MIT did uh, in Boston did a study about what can we learn from Europe on industrial competitiveness. And what they found this big team was that for example, southern Germany, it's an ecosystem. It's so much, it's so many things. It's the skills level, it's uh, mm -hmm. the network of chambers of commerce helping each other, it's uh, connections, it's 
there are so many things and good research institutes, the Fraunhofer institutes, but there are so many things. And I think one should also look a little wider now at the, the key performance indicators in the competitiveness strategy. I don't know if you some, probably some have read this uh, commission communication that was under for the March European Council. I think that's a rather well-balanced set of indicators on competitiveness in a wide range, also going into skills, going into R&D, but also energy costs and other things. So, so I think it's important to have this kind of wider angle where you also invest in, in people, for, for example. So that is also an important part of this discussion. I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone want to come in on that? Or? Um. I, possibly, I mean, just to go back on the concept of regulatory superpower, I think that we just have to watch out that we're not just that, you see what I mean, that we, we, we come up with the good standards, we come up with the good rules, but we don't produce anything and we don't, we're in every, you see, so yeah, I'm quite proud of being, of being told that the EU is a regular, the sets of regulatory standards and sort of defines the rules of the world, but if, if we're not an actual player, Mm. Yeah, I think uh, interesting here is also the ETS uh, yeah, um, and how that is uh, the European way of, uh, or has always been the European way of, you know, uh, of, of pushing sustainability in green industry, whereas the, the Americans say they, they used more the tax uh, benefits in a more direct way. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe that would be an interesting question as well. How, which role do you see the ETS uh, play in, in, in the whole industrial pol uh, policy debate, in the whole green in the industry debate? I mean, it, it, it's quite clear now from uh, what's happening that it's not enough, but it, 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 uh, should it play a more important role in the future? Um, I think it is playing a role in the sense that the increase of the carbon price is one of the reasons that leads many industries to have to reconsider their production processes. Uh, they, it's quoted often by industry as one of the reasons why they're fully feeling pushed against the wall. Um, now, whether that's enough or you need also significant amounts of state support, uh, state direct support, I, I don't know. It's also difficult to see. I mean, on the one hand, you can say, yes, I mean, we don't see industries closing shop every day all over the place in Europe. But if you speak a lot to a lot of industry people, what they say is that slowly, 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 we are somewhat decreasing. And there might be lost opportunities of not having a better investment climate than we could have. So we're probably not falling off the cliff, but we are probably not making the best, the best out of it. Uh, Best out of it either. Mm -hmm. Thanks, um, Mats. I think you wanted to come in. Well, just a brief comment, and, and that is also to look at the ETS developments now on the, in the natural perspective. We cannot take CBAM implementation for granted, I would say, based on our analysis uh, with the negative counter reactions and other parts of the world. It's really important also in this context to have these partnerships and to drive climate action globally because very much now on the decarbonization of industry is dependent on on the CBAM, I would say. So so I just uh, emphasize this international cooperation there as, as well. Um, and also the money from the ETS mm -hmm. to the Innovation Fund is really also driving a lot of uh, change. And there I think it's and the, probably I guess the Commission is not doing that, but with a compromise uh, between Parliament and Council on the ETS, there's need for interpretation, I guess, exactly what can the money now be used for this rather huge amount. And one can argue that already now, circular economy solutions that lower emissions, for example, could be financed. But what will be the scope for what, what you said about, I think, collection systems, infrastructure, innovative solutions, uh, that is also part of this puzzle, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe I, I will turn to a question from, from the audience. Um, there is someone um, asking about um, yeah, more concrete insights into the green competitiveness and trade policy nexus. What is there on the, on the menu of the Swedish presidency and of the commission, I guess, in terms of free trade agreements, raw materials, uh, club, uh, climate club, TTC, WTO? I mean, 
he mentions a lot, but I think um, maybe if we could get some more insights in what is sort of going forward, the plan when it comes to free trade agreements, when it comes to uh, what does this raw materials club that of course is mentioned in the green industrial, uh, green deal industrial plan, uh, what, uh, what it does, uh, will it look like? Um, and also the net zero industry partnerships, maybe you can um, Joachim, maybe yeah. you can give some more concrete examples and also what, what the plans look like. Well, the free trade agreements open space for the development of raw material partnerships in that they create their polit political signal that this is a country that we can trust and that we can do business with, that we're comfortable to do business with. Uh, you can also have critical raw material partnerships without there being a free trade agreement. There might also be thorny issues of to what extent you want to put free trade principles at the forefront or access to raw materials at the forefront. For instance, would you be happy to have a raw material partnership with a country that would have partially nationalized its raw material industry, which would preclude our mining industry from possibly acting there, but would allow us to have access to their raw materials through their nationalized or quasi-nationalized outfit? Uh, these are uncomfortable questions that we will probably have to address in the near future, uh, because as you said, I mean, most the, the, the third, the, most third countries want to develop local industries as a result of our interest in raw materials. The thing that they tell us all the time is you, you're not going to come here just to extract our stuff and do your industries in Europe. No, we want you to do your batteries a bit here or as much as possible here. Uh, and, you know, this is a give and take, so we don't know. And also, social, environmental, it's also difficult. I mean, if you put the bar too high, if you impose, you know, if you say, I'm only going to do partnerships on raw materials in Africa and in Latin America if the environmental standards are as good as Europe, you know, probably you'll, you'll get nothing. But how far are you happy to compromise, you know, uh, because they all, you know, we've also got Finland and Sweden as strong mining countries that are a good example that you can have thriving mining industries while being socially and environmentally very responsible. But, and also the third countries, they, they are interested them, themselves in improving their, 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 their social and environmental standards. So, um, the club would be a a combination of the the idea would be to have a forum where buying and selling countries would get together to see how to go through these things. But yes, there are you know free trade versus access to raw materials and uh, access to raw materials versus environmental and social questions that are gonna be difficult to handle. Yeah, and I think it also comes then down to the questions, which countries do we have these partnerships with? Where's the threshold that we say, you know, we still do that or not? And the whole debate about like-minded country clubs, right? So yeah. do they have to be like us? Do they have to have the same values or how far <laughs> do they have the same values? Uh, I think these are all very, very interesting questions. Um, and possibly, as uh, you know, as uh, I think you said too, that we're probably not as powerful as we like to think we are. It's not that these countries are all rushing to put themselves at the availability of Europe because Europe suddenly thought about them. You know, uh, we have to give them something. We have to convince them. We we probably need them more than they need us. Yeah. Anyone else uh, from the panel who would like to come in? Yeah. Yeah, no, I just want to to echo what the director said. Um, let's continue pushing towards more cooperation, of course, more trade agreements um, on on this. Um, I think the, we very much welcome the early talks with uh, with India, but then maybe something that was not mentioned: uh, the Global Gateway. Maybe it's. Uh, um, it's actually an initiative where we think we we should provide more also more funds to to make yeah. it more bold. Um, uh, it's there. Let's let's make it happen. Um, 
and then uh, indeed try to to diversify as as much as possible. Um, um, Joachim said before. Um, that we cannot rely exclusively on on Australia or New Zealand. Absolutely, uh, I think that's uh, that's a good um, setting. Let's say a good mindset to try to diversify as much as possible, which uh, is the background of uh, of the recent proposals, of course. Um, so yeah, we we have to continue on this on this basis and uh, ensure. Um, sustainable supply chain, which means, of course, this give and take, of course, um, that, that was just mentioned. Um, so, yeah, let's let's continue on this basis, maybe. So uh, if uh, no one wants to come in on that uh, for now, I would um, propose uh, to open the floor to questions from the audience. So, uh, yeah. Yes, please. Parliamentary Research Service. Uh, thanks for this uh, event debate. Um, I want to reconnect to the subject of the environmental and social factors when uh, we make trade. Um, and my question, in fact, was uh, about how we cope uh, with the competitiveness of other big actors like United States and China on this field of uh, social rights, human rights, uh, environmental rights when we go to buy this uh, raw material to make partnership with this country because i think it will not we will not play with the same uh, rule uh, for the game uh, they have other other rules or they don't have rules for the same game uh, and i think this is will put us in a in a kind of difficulty so how how we can react to this and also how we can um how we can uh, um match uh what we want to achieve with the with this raw material um and what we want to achieve with other kind of regulation like the due diligence and so on i think it's not easy yeah? honestly thanks yeah thanks for this uh, very important question uh, who would like to come in if you want i um i think it's their self interest in the sense that most of the countries, you know, it's probably not perfect democracies, but there are some sort of electoral processes. And if you have a project that gives you good conditions to the workers, that improves the environmental sustainability of the place, that brings schools, roads, and that the whole package is seen as attractive, we have a chance of eating our competitors, let's put it like that. Maybe I'm repeating myself. Another said you said this is well director, but but if when we interview people in Geneva, for example, trade people, of course they have their own interest from from other parts of the world. But it's also linked to this issue about partnerships that we have been talking about. If the offer from the EU side is for genuine partnerships, and and you can see that countries like. Uh, uh, Chile or others who want to have uh, have more value from their production of, of raw materials, that there is some listening to them and there is a way forward. And in particular in Africa, uh, countries where it's possible to, to do progress, it's easier to have the ESG debate. It's not simple. I, I wouldn't say that. There will be conflicts over human rights and, and environment and so But But if it's part of a broader real partnership offer, I think it's easier. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to pose a question? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Massimo Busuoli, I'm the director of the Norwegian University of Science and Technology Brussels Office. I would like to move the discussion to another dimension, which is the dimension of skills. Uh, you, you have spoken about uh, all the aspects which uh, links to industry and so on, but we notice from the educational point of view, a lot of pressure that is increasing on the capability of the educational system to deliver the necessary skills. Uh, we have noticed in the latest uh, communication from the Commission, if we start from the innovation strategy up to the Green Deal industrial strategy, and now with the net zero uh, industrial strategy, that uh, there is a lot of attention on skills. And uh, 
I would like to ask you, do you think that the currently the, the, the educational system or the training system of Europe is fit for purpose? Because on one side, we think that from the university point of view, there is an increasing pressure on changing the way universities are delivering because there is a need for fast skills. And you know that universities are not fast in delivering training. So somehow there is a need for the system to adapt quite a lot. On the other side, if the university are not capable to take this uh, challenge, there is the possibility that the private companies are taking this and with the risk of decreasing the quality to some extent because there is not a quality control. So I would like to hear your take on this. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Very interesting question. Um, who would like to take that one? Take it maybe. Um, yes, very relevant and you're right. So we, we've been stressing us the, the skills aspect uh, until now. Um, but I mean, it, skills are, are the fuel, if I can say, of, of the green transition of, of any uh, developments in, in our industry. So um, I mean, if you ask about, you know, uh, which kind of backgrounds do we need because we are feeling some some shortages, I, th I think the uh, the STEM um, um, diploma, let's say, are, are the ones that, that we need the most, especially in the green transition, um, for the green transition technologies. So uh, engineering, so technological um, skills, um, but also some... Uh, Maybe from less from from STEM, but more also monitoring, so also some legal compliance. That that's also a must. But then, uh, from our side, at least, this is also how we we work a lot with uh, with universities is to ensure this cooperation, uh, this ecosystem um, to happen on on the ground. We have, you know, many uh, research projects uh, with universities, many working students as well. Um, joining um, Siemens, um, and uh, you, you were mentioning, you know, that we may lose some some quality. It's true, but I guess if we ensure this in sectoral, um, intersectoral um, uh, moving uh, moves from uh, professors, also looking beyond the students as such, but from professors in universities, uh, scientists in. Uh, in um, in companies will ensure to to have a win-win solutions for for both universities and uh, and companies and will move forward of course all innovations um that that we need i mean we we are still quite uh, i would say leading in europe in terms of uh, clean tech uh, patents uh, i was looking at some data and and it's still impressive but uh the the issue of course is that we are eroding our our leading position there. Uh, so we we have to push forward for more skills, but also for more cooperation. So it's broader than uh, than the education, I, uh, I bear to say. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else who would like to come in? Yes, please, Ursula. Thank you. No, I think this is a really important issue. I mean, whenever I talk to the businesses we work with, they talk about the need for uh, trained people, whether it is construction, whether it is on digital skills, more STEM based. So it's not just digital, but it's also kind of different elements. And I think a lot of the work we have done has also shown um, that the different impacts on regions. And so this is why this in dis industrial ecosystems point is really important because um, when you look at a region, they may have benefits from the green transition, they may have and they may lose different factories you know if you think you can clearly see that when you look at the co2 emissions from cars issue for example there's different types of jobs coming up there are digital jobs um, versus perhaps some of the production line jobs and so forth so there needs to be a real modeling of the impact of the new pieces of regulation what that means for the types of jobs you're going to need the types of education and really invest in that and also beyond skills, really consider how that translates into decent jobs for people. Because again, if we're going to have this massive transition, we need to bring people and communities along with us. So it's not just about reskilling, it's about providing decent jobs for communities and considering how that all adds up uh, to something. But I mean, broadly, a lot of the work we've done and others have done has shown that the transition means very interesting and a lot of jobs, right? It's not just about job losses, it's about a real shift in where and what types of jobs, basically. And possibly also what we have noticed is that 
if an industry goes, the expertise and the know-how goes. Like if we are to recapture, for instance, some importance on the solar PV industry or the solar related, and we, we'd now rely on Chinese know-how when we were the know-how of the world 10 years ago. Or, you know, many, there's a link between nobody trains themselves on something that has no practical application. Um, you don't find many nuclear scientists in Germany, for instance, and you find a lot in you find a lot in France. Why? Yeah. Um, yeah, in Germany, it was even the debate of we're losing this technology and also the expertise because now there is no more nuclear power. But yeah, anyone else who would like to pose a question? Um, Alexandra Major from the Austrian Central Bank. Thank you very much for this uh, insightful um, discussion. Two points you've already touched upon, which I would like to ask you to maybe could further explore. The one thing was that um, you mentioned that we're still at edge uh, on the, on the on the on the patents and the, and the the, the know-how in Europe. Um, however, on the other side, we know that um, we're very strong on that, but we can't scale it up. So, and that ties in with uh, the financing, and which you've also touched upon already. But I'm, I'm just wondering, big companies like Siemens, it's even for them, I suppose, it's, it's a challenge. But well, what do we do with the backbone of the European um, economy that is um, um, SMEs? Uh, and for that, I think for, for them, it's even more, more of a challenge because um, they just well, probably can't as easily apply for state aid or what have you. How, could you further explore on, on these issues, this, this link with we have the knowledge and know-how, but are unable to and somehow keep um, the, the good ideas in Europe? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So the, the scaling issue on how to make business models out of ideas, basically. Yeah. Anyone who would like to respond to that? Yeah. Yeah, no, um, you're right. Of course, I, I speak on behalf of Siemens, but I mean, to, to be frank, um, in our value chains, we have uh, multiple of SMEs, of course, as you said, they are the backbone of, of our economy. So um, we, we always try to, you know, to reflect on what are the best framework conditions also for them. And that's why I mentioned, again, the single market at the beginning, because if we ultimately are able to cope with, the, with 27 national uh, um, requirements, I mean, it's not optimal, but we'll survive, honestly. Uh, but when it comes to SMEs, they won't be able to, to grow. And if, because you started uh, your questions with, uh, with innovations, I mean, if we look at the startups, uh, okay, we don't have a definition of startups, if I'm not wrong, but um, they're, let's say, innovative SMEs. If if we use this this definition, at least it's artificial. But to to get, to say my point, um, to to make them grow in in Europe and and avoid that they go, I don't know, in, in the Silicon Valley or or wherever. I think we really to need to stress this these ecosystems and this um, single market approach that uh, that we discussed. And uh, last but not least, we have to try to de-risk um, unbankable um, solutions, projects. I think here um, um, the, the many European projects and funds um, are of help, but also again, um, back to taxonomy, it's, it's a way forward to ensure um, that that unbankable solutions become bankable. Um, the EAC is also strong. I think environmental, um, the, the European Innovation Council is strong also for, for startups and, and SMEs. So um, solutions are there, but going back to, to what I was saying at the beginning, yes, single market. And secondly, simplification of all this um, support we have. Yeah, uh, if anyone else would like to come in on that, I, I would say we do that. Otherwise, uh, we are approaching the end of, of this policy dialogue. Uh, I'm very sorry that I couldn't take in all the questions, uh, uh, whether it's here in person or but also online. There were a lot of interesting questions still. Um, so I apologize to those people. But I would, uh, first of all, thank uh, very much everyone on the panel uh, who we had the pleasure today to, to have here, uh, who contributed with a, some very interesting in, insights. 
and uh, yeah, thank you everyone for, for coming to making the way to the EPC, but also for connecting online. Um, yeah, it was a pleasure. Um, I wish you a, a, a nice rest of the day and hope to see you soon again. And um, thank, you sorry, sorry. See, yeah. thank you for my Thank you for my CFs as well.